Rarely is anything immediately successful in life. Almost every accomplishment in human history started with a series of ideas which failed, were refined, failed again, and were refined until they reached their optimal outcome. This is true for ancient humans attempting to start agriculture. People in the industrial age trying to harness the power of steam. And for battle mechs in battle tech. While the mech we're going to review today is independent of what came before, it is also a part of it. The two together tell one story. This samurai inspired battle mech, born from perhaps one of the worst mechs of all time, is considered to be an iconic resurgence in the Combine, as a result of Luthien armor works. A charger no more. In this video, we will be looking at the mighty Hatamato Chi. An assault mech weighing in at 80 tons. The Hatamato Chi is a mech born from a series of problems the Draconis Combine was facing after the Fourth Succession War. To fully understand it, we have to begin to examine what exactly happened in the years leading up to the initial production and deployment for the Draconis Combine. One of the most maligned mechs, from one of the most maligned manufacturers in the Inner Sphere's history, was the Charger. This 80-ton machine was essentially incapable of defending itself with anything that resembled a weapon system. It wasn't fast enough. It wasn't armored enough. It had the most expensive engine of its era, and it was considered to be a disgraceful coffin for anyone who got inside of it. Barring just attempting to physically bully lighter mechs, which was unreliable as well, it could perform nothing that even remotely resembled a battlefield role. The Charger was considered to be so rotten that even after it was purchased initially by the Star League Defense Forces, it was withdrawn from service for being a, quote, light mech trapped inside of an assault mech frame, unquote. And ironically enough, if only it were as heavily armed as a light mech, or not slower than one, this quote might have even been more than half accurate. The Succession Wars, however, saved the Charger, as well as Wells Technologies, the corporation that produced it insofar that the houses needed any mech that they could find, and they were willing to even buy the backlogged inventory of chargers from the nearly defunct wells. Worse for the Combine, they would be the ones who had this company operating within their territories. So as its production came back online, it would be the Combine who would foolishly continue to purchase these mechs, assuming that having these battle mechs at all was better than simply not having them. Financially speaking, this wasn't true, and their minimal to frankly negative impact on any battlefield performance proved to be a hindrance for centuries to the DCMS. This would in essence conclude once it was found that Wells Technologies were in fact secretly selling Charger components outside of normal channels, including to the enemies of the Combine State. Those executives who were caught were brought to justice, as others fled into neighboring countries in order to avoid the dragon's wrath. The lineup of chargers would be largely down after this event, which appeared to be the beginning of the end of the charger indefinitely. But this tomb of a battle mech would be far more fortunate than its pilots. A multitude of new purposes could be found for its 80-ton chassis, especially after the discovery of the Helm Memory Core, which allowed for XL engine technology. This is to say nothing of the Assault Mech of Desperation, which was purchased and then modified by the Capellan Confederation in the form of the Charger 1A5. The Combine itself would begin to experiment with a multitude of options for the Charger, creating a series of mechs that would attempt to redeem the model even if it was not always a success, despite these new technologies. The Fourth Succession War had changed the balance of power in the Inner Sphere, 
for the Free Worlds League, Draconis Combine and Capellan Confederation had been driven from the core of human space around Terra, creating a bridge between the now former Lyran Commonwealth and Federated Suns, allowing for a single, continuous Federated Commonwealth, the new superstate born at the very start of this brutal war. For the Capellans, they were left shattered and broken by the war, though the Combine and Free Worlds League would be bruised by this as well. The attempt at keeping these houses allied against a common foe had not been successful in the first outing of warfare, and now only the Combine and League were left as functioning major states. Comstar, the instigator of this alliance, would intervene by beginning to provide these states with additional support. In the case of the Draconis Combine, they would receive more than plentiful assistance. One of the most remarkable points was the delivery of the Thug 80-ton assault mech. While most of these were deliberately downgraded from their Star League era designs, which was what the Combine had been expecting, some examples that had arrived were in fact supporting their original configurations, including every advanced onboard Star League era system. Knowing the complications that could come about as a result of this, namely Comstar discovering these advanced models had been accidentally shipped, the thugs, along with several other designs that were delivered in this way, were mostly hidden away to be dissected for the secrets of their advanced technologies. A decision was made, though, to begin to produce the thug themselves. Though it was obvious that their Comstar counterpart, who were as much allies as they were enemies in many respects, would become aware, potentially, of the mistaken deliveries. In order to circumvent this, it was decided that much of what the thug had been could be replicated in a similar chassis, or most of their own production. Chassis production, along with the intricacies of developing a whole new body, could take precious time and might still give away their valuable acquisitions. So the option to find a pre-existing mech to be used as a delivery system for the thug-style design was sought after. It didn't take long for the most obvious choice to be found. The defunct charger line, even with mild interest being put into it, had a multitude of chassis left over as well as for the ability of the former Wells Technologies now inert production lines to be brought back online. These lines, which were meant for assault mech production, could be subtly altered for this purpose. Changes were made, opening up the spacious torsos to allow for the thug's SRMs by downgrading the engine. Alterations were further than applied to its appearance, and not long after, a new battle mech had been forged in the Draconis Combine. Even if it was, in essence, a thug, few would immediately realize it. Not the Federated Commonwealth, certainly, and not Comstar. They would provide this new battle mech with the title of Hatamoto Chi, with the first model being the HTM 26T. After the largely victorious campaign of the Fourth Succession War, Hans Davian would intend to bring the rest of the Inner Sphere to heal in several stages. Moving on to his next focus, another hated rival of his house's past, the Draconis Combine. It is interesting to note that the Order of the Federated Commonwealth's military actions seem to focus more on House Davian's primary rivals and borders, rather than on House Steiner's. The Capellan Confederation had been the principal rival and antagonist to House Davian, more so than House Steiner. Though there was bad blood, of course, between the Lyrans and the Combine, it was more the Davian agenda to see them brought down in as spectacular a fashion as House Liao. With the creation of the Free Rosselhaig Republic, it also removed much of the contested worlds between the Combine and now the former Lyran Commonwealth, making this even more of a Davian project even from this perspective. More interesting yet, even after the War of 3039, Prior to the clan invasion, a few observers noted that the Federated Commonwealth was performing war games on the border with the Torian Concordat in a suspiciously aggressive manner. 
as they had prior to the intervention campaigns in other states. This means that had the clans not invaded, if there was another war launched by the Commonwealth, it appears that it may have been a war against yet another one of the Thorns in Davian's side, rather than Steiner's. All the same, both sides would prepare for war. Comstar provided mechs, materials, and information to the Draconis Combine and its coordinator, the legendary Theodore Carita. The Federated Commonwealth would lean into their own communications network through a series of black boxes in order to try to circumvent Comstar's interference as a shadow war was launched between the United Davian and Steiner's intelligence services and Comstar's ROM. The only problem was the black box network had been compromised and between that and the HPG grid, any element of surprise was lost by the Federated Commonwealth. When the offensive was launched by the mightiest military force in the Inner Sphere, it would result in a disastrous defeat for the Federated Commonwealth. The reasons for it, though, were many. First, the attack was of course telegraphed to the Combine, who could plan ahead of their advance. Second, the Combine had several rare mech designs with advanced technologies often mixed into them which the Federated Commonwealth hadn't taken into account. Third, poor coordination between the Lyran and Federated Sun units played a role in the defeat as well, so much so that major reforms were enacted after the failed campaign. Finally, the Grand Bluff by Theodore Carita, which saw the DCMS confuse, outmaneuver, and outwit the Federated Commonwealth's forces into believing that their enemy's force had been larger than anticipated, as well as thoroughly defeating several important commands. This culminated in a defeat which set back Hans Davian's plans to reunite the Inner Sphere. The Federated Commonwealth would never be able to maim or annex the Combine after this humiliation. During this conflict, though, the Hatamoto Chi would see its first outing. When Davian and Steiner pilots were faced down by this altered charger, they had no idea what to anticipate. The Thug had become a near extinct design in the Inner Sphere, and this new battle mech most certainly didn't look like a Thug. Federated mech warriors who stood up against this thing had no idea what they really faced, and would quickly find themselves undone by it as its heavy armor and decent firepower tore through their battle mechs, all while their battle computers gave them no relevant data, or misidentified the mech as a much less dangerous charger design. Even the charger itself would be used in this conflict, and several major refits were tested during it as well. This was repeated with several other mechs, including the entirely new design of the Dakabu, which would later evolve into the Mahler series of battle mechs. The Haramoto Chi wouldn't be fielded in huge numbers during the conflict, but many lessons were learned by the Combine in terms of its shortcomings, such as having limited ammunition, which would be revised later. The HMT successor would appear in time to see battle in the Desperate, nightmarish struggle of the Draconis Combine during the clan invasion, facing down clans Novakat and Smoke Jaguar in a life or death struggle. The Haramoto Chi would be one of the stalwart defenders across dozens of worlds that would fall in the defense of the Combine, and would inevitably stand tall and victorious along with the rest of the DCMS and its allies in the vital and important Battle of Luthien the capital of the Draconis Combine. The Combine would tremble from this onslaught. It would stagger, but it would not fall. And it would be the dragon that emerged victorious. First, with the annihilation of the true Clan Smoke Jaguar. And then later, with the harrowing, destruction, and expulsion of the maimed remnants of Clan Novakat during the Dark Age. In both cases, the Haramoto Chi and its successor designs would be the ones on the side of the victorious.
First built for combat in 3039, though not reaching a proper production run outside of early models until 3041, the HTM 2060 Hadamato Chi is one of the best accomplishments of the Draconis Combine from this era. Reverse engineering the thug, concealing that they'd done so by remaking it in the Charger's chassis, and then using them on the battlefield is one of the best results in the history of the setting and warfare at the time. This 80-ton monster did not initially benefit, in the 2060 configuration, from the advances made by the Helm Memory Core, making it use baseline Inner Sphere technologies in this instance. This means by default it would have a standard gyro, internal structure, and cockpit. It is important to note that Endo Steel would be reintroduced to the mech as quickly as possible, once the Combine had reconstituted their centuries lost infrastructure and manufacturing for it. But that does not apply to the 26T, that applies to the 27T. From what I can tell, the 26T doesn't have any listed design quirks. The 27T, however, its successor, has Battle Fist, easy to maintain, and modular weapons for its torso SRMs. Given its appearance, it seems likely that it's an oversight that the 2060 doesn't also possess these features. The Charger is famous for its ability to run 86 km per hour as an assault mech. This feature is dropped in the HTM series outright, making it much more in line with its Thug series origins. Powered by the ever-present 22.5-ton Pitban 320 Fusion standard engine, this battle mech can move up to a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour, or six movement points in the tabletop game. This is more than acceptable for the Hadamato Chi, given its battle line role. It can move at the rate of strategic operations for the inner sphere, and most importantly it's quick enough to keep up with medium troopers and the heavy mechs it's meant to be deployed with or meant to support. Without access to double heatsink technologies, the HTM 2060 has a limited ability to keep itself cool, but still does so acceptably well for the era of its design. It contributes 7 tons to cooling, bringing it to a total of 17 heatsinks. This puts it halfway between a Marauder and a Warhammer in terms of its heatsink count, and that means it will run relatively hot while firing its main cannons every turn but it can walk and fire its primary systems one turn without reaching a critical level of overheating. This isn't necessarily ideal, but there are far worse cooled machines from this era of the Succession Wars, including the famous Marauder. Modeled after the Thug, the Hatamatochi more or less replicates its predecessor's armament, which is considered to be one of the most effective weapons packages on an 80-ton mech for the general Star League era through to the Succession Wars. With one mounted in each arm, the HTM 26T has a pair of Tigart particle projection cannons, giving it solid hitting power at a distance. Much like the traditional Warhammers, Marauders, or newcomers of this era like the Cataphracts, while this doesn't make the HTM 2060 particularly unique, it does make it a reliable quantity. To back these up at close range, it has a pair of Baikal 6 SRM-6 racks, which deliver a follow-up scatter damage towards targets, crit seeking against exposed armor or sensitive locations like the head. These two systems are not, however, well supplied, having a single ton of SRM-6 ammunition between the two of them meaning that attacks must be used to their maximum effect with this weapon, as after 15 rounds are fired, these two launchers will go silent. Much like the Thug, these two tiers of weapons work well together. The PPCs strip armor off at range, and the SRMs fill damaged locations in close, under ideal conditions. Being often what is referred to as an intro-tech battle mech, the 2060 only has one real way to provide itself with physical defense, which is investing in armor. It most definitely does that, with a staggering 14.5 tons of Mitchell Aragon standard plating, providing it with an immense 232 points of armor. While this does mean that it is shy of the thug, 
which benefits from Endo Steel, it is still almost in line with an Awesome's overall protection, which is incredibly impressive for this era, especially given the Haramato Chi moves faster than this dedicated fire platform. This makes this 80 ton battle mech more armored than most 80 to 90 ton machines for its time. It is extremely difficult to displace or destroy on the field of battle. The Hadamoto Chi is mostly based on the Thug's original design. It's not hard to imagine that this would yield an excellent assault mech as a consequence of this, given the superb capabilities of the Thug itself. This, the most ground level variant of the HTM series, would be a platform to build more unique and powerful designs moving forward as well. Able to take extreme damage, put out consistent fire for the period, albeit perhaps running hot from time to time doing so, and having the ability to take out opponents in close after softening them up at range, the Hadamato Chi is an excellent successor to the Charger and Thug. Even if at the time of the 2060, it failed to live up entirely to the Star League era's Thug's fighting power. This ends up being an excellent mech to fill direct fire support roles, or to operate as a medium range battle line mech in almost any formation for this branch of the Succession Wars. One can't help but feel pity for the Federated Commonwealth pilots who unknowingly faced this mech down in the War of 3039 and died in fear and confusion as a result. Much like the Charger, the Hadamato Chi would see a prolific number of variants deployed in the later eras. Some see changes in roles, and some even see changes in its battle mech quirks. This versatile chassis is a staple of the DCMS as a result. In this video we will be covering several of those alternative configurations now. A successor to the HTM 26T and 27T. The HTM 28T began production in 3059 and is a major modernization package for the famous design. Part of the way it internally makes this possible is by downgrading its engine from a Pitman 320 to a 240 standard engine. While this does slow the design, it gives it over 10 tons to invest in other spaces as well as achieving this without the durability drawbacks of an XL engine. To help compensate for this, it does also install jump jets. This means it can run up to 54 kilometers per hour, or jump 90 meters overall. While not great for an 80 ton battle mech, this is still somewhat serviceable. The most important upgrade, something which the Combine lagged for many years prior to this, was the introduction of double heat sinks giving the HTM 28T an impressive, but necessary, 17 double heat sinks, allowing it to cool 34 every turn. This ends up being necessary, of course, because the 28T utilizes ER PPCs, instead of standard PPCs, allowing it to hit harder in close if needed in order to punch holes in enemy armor, or strike out at further distances. In both cases, it can now do so with no heat problem, giving it a clear edge in this respect. It also upgrades its SRM missiles to SRM-6 streaks, giving it the ability to save heat and ammunition should it not gain an adequate target lock. It uses cases for the ammunition to contain ammunition explosions in the worst case scenario. A C3 system is on board as well, notably a slave system allowing it to participate in tailored lances which can help feed targeting information to one another, so long as a master is on the field in one of the machines in the network. Finally, a pair of ER medium lasers are also added to the design, allowing it to fire these, plus its missiles, in close, attempting to hit vulnerable targets which have already had their armor opened up or softened by PPCs prior, following the thug's tried and tested battle strategy. While its firepower is good, its cooling is good, and it can jump, it does have the already stated drawback of being slow. This isn't always the biggest problem for an assault mech, but it does mean that it's not fast enough to keep up with battle line lances, which means it is more probably going to be put into a much more intense battle, which even this upgrade may find itself struggling in. It would be hard for this mech to bully a Banshee 5S, for instance.
an evolution of the HTM series, this battle mech changes its battlefield role dramatically. Originally equipped in its experimental format entirely for water-based combat, an evolution of the HTM series, the HTM-35K Hotamoto Kairu changes its battlefield role dramatically. Originally equipped in its experimental format almost entirely for water-based combat, the mainline model would be re-equipped for a more prominent role in ground operations, though does retain two torpedo launchers on board in its legs all the same. To save weight for the overall design, it uses an XL engine, as well as composite endosteel internal structure. It has ferrofibrous armor, of which it has 14 tons, giving it more than impressive protection. Funnily enough, it also has a full head ejection system, likely due to it being an aquatic design. The Kairu, as it's often assumed to be operating in a water environment, is undersynced for land combat in many instances, only operating with a baseline number of heat sinks. In water, this is much less of an issue, as it will get significant cooling bonuses from the liquid environment. Beyond this, it has twin LRM-15 launchers, with one in each torso. Each one has one ton of ammunition for surface-level engagements. It has four medium lasers, also installed in its torsos, to back this up with short-range fire. Snub-nosed PPCs are installed in each arm, which can operate easily in both environments. And then in the legs, it has a pair of short-range torpedoes for dedicated water battles. All in all, the Kairu is an interesting design, and one which is often unseen for battle mechs. Its XL engine is a huge liability in the water though, as if the torso's armor is breached, not even destroyed, it floods the entire engine and disables the mech. Still, this is a fascinating alternative design for the Hadamato Chi. A mech almost significant enough to deserve its own video, the Hatamoto Suna is displayed with a full technical readout entry in Technical Readout Dark Age and Technical Readout 3150. To start with, the Suna is most definitely an innovative take on the venerable design and chassis, upping its armaments and installing the cutting edge of advanced armor plating. It is not, however, without drawbacks and appears to have been mishandled on a manufacturing level, so much so that it suffers from the poor workmanship quirk. Many Combine units, after recent conflicts with the Republic of the Sphere, Draconis Combine Civil War, and the destruction of the Novacats, had been in need of a new assault mech to fill their ranks that was tough and not as expensive as some of the more sophisticated newer models such as the Tenshi. This would allow the Suna to spread through the being rebuilt DCMS, and as a further consequence, the Suna would be seen as a major combat mech during the now devastating Draconis Combine Federated Suns War. This machine would be seen as an extreme remake of the original HTM series. Once again it drops the engine to a 240 standard, in this case a General Motors variant of the engine, ensuring that it can move 54 km per hour firmly placing it in a breakthrough role. It invests no tonnage into heat sinks, giving it 10 doubles, resulting in 20 sinking capacity every turn. This is fine though given it mostly uses ballistic weapons. It also turns to an XL gyro in order to save weight, potentially causing an issue should its side torsos be critically hit, especially due to the poor workmanship quirk as mentioned prior. Its offensive systems are very simple, and very much not to be underestimated. It has a mighty Imperator Dragon's Fire Gauss Rifle mounted in the left arm, still one of the best weapons in the setting even in the Dark Age. And it is backed up by two Apollo FCS enhanced Chugunga MRM-20 launchers, with a total of 18 shots per launcher. Finally, it has a head-mounted Diverse Optics Type 20X Extended Range Medium Laser. In essence, it batters its target, punching holes in the armor with its Gauss Rifle, before bombarding them with waves of enhanced MRM missiles. It is a simple tactic, and a valid one. To enhance this Samurai-inspired mech further, its defensive package is extremely impressive. 
was 17.5 tons of the Combine's most advanced plating, namely its ballistic reinforced armor. This confers to it 210 points of armor overall, but ballistic weapons, including autocannons, ghost rifles, and missiles, are reduced by half in terms of their damage value to a limit of one. This battle mech is as a result extraordinarily well defended from incoming fire, particularly from ballistic fire. The Hadamoto Suna, the HTM-30S, is a fantastic war machine for what it is. Though despite its tough outer shell, its rush to production has given it a serious weakness, at least at the moment. Overall, this battle mech hits hard, and can take a beating until it loses its outer plating. It serves well in the DCMS, and will see battle undoubtedly for decades to come especially once its faults are ironed out. The HTMS-30S will be a part of the fighting on New Avalon, almost assuredly, battling back against Davian in their desperate attempt to liberate their capital from the yoke of the dragon's oppression. Even in the Dark Age and Ill Clan era, the Hatamoto series is far from being done in Battletech. The Charger was one of those designs given many chances. Even if the Core series has more mixed results, even in later designs, it's been given so many opportunities as to simply not waste the 80-ton versatile chassis that it has. The Hotomoto series is an example of the Charger evolving into something new. Marrying the Charger and the Thug together into a design resulted in one of the most recognizable battle mechs of the Draconis Combine and one which over time would increasingly evolve into its own distinct mech. Whether that be it as an amphibious warrior, or as a long to medium range battering ram that is the Hatamoto Suna. The series and its designers have never been afraid to fit the HTM into a new role for an assault mech class, needed by the Draconis Combine's mustard soldiery. This samurai inspired warrior stands tall with the Combine's military efforts. Whether that have been in the defense against the Federated Commonwealth, a state they have outlived, or the assault by Novacat and Smoke Jaguar, two other states which they have outlived. The Hatamoto series fought and tore back their worlds from the Republic as well, yet another state that the Combine and now Hatamoto series have outlived. What other fools are yet to fall before the dragon and its mech warriors is a good question. Time will only tell. But know that the Hotomoto series will likely be standing alongside the Combine in its struggle for supremacy. And it will stand tall in their inevitable victory. Thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel. And I can't thank you enough. Because this content is only possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will see all of you in the comments section below.